So welcome everybody to our webinar tonight that we've entitled Selling Sponsorships in Football. It's an absolute pleasure to have you connecting here tonight. My name is Diego Valdez. I am the founder and general director at the Sports Business Institute Barcelona, better known as SBI or SBI Barcelona. And I'm sure many of you know who we are, but for those that don't know and it's your first time connecting, what we do is we offer educational programs for those that look to start or advance their career in the business side of football. And tonight we're joined by um, our very special guest and colleague, um, Richard Lamb. Rich, as you will see him online, uh, is um, someone that's been involved in the football industry for many years. He's held senior executive roles at clubs such as Manchester United, Inter Milan, West Ham United. He's also done some work with the NFL in the UK, among other clients in sports and outside of sports. And of course, Rich is also a, an important part of SBI as he is the academic lead for our Master in Football Business and Management. So Rich, it's a real pleasure to have you here tonight as always. Hey Diego, great to speak again. And uh, just to, to welcome everyone else online, uh, wherever you're calling in from, really lovely to have you uh, here and uh, be able to share this evening's session. Fantastic. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is we've prepared a few questions for Rich to talk and discuss on various subjects relating to sponsorships. But then we're going to open up the floor for your questions and your opportunity to come and, um, you know, share your point of view or your, your comments, questions at the end of the session. Obviously, um, you know, in, in football, uh, being a competitive sport, both on and off the pitch, Sponsorships are a um, key revenue driver for whether it's clubs or leagues or national teams or, or even athletes themselves. So what we're going to be looking at tonight is going to try to unpack, you know, how do clubs and how do properties attract those sponsors? How are the contracts negotiated? And, you know, what's the best way to retain a sponsor? So among other things, those are some of the subjects that we're going to cover. And of course, understanding from the brand side, you know, how, how do they get ROI? Why do they, they get involved in sponsorships? So um, evidently, um, sponsorships are a crucial element of financial support for, for these properties. And uh, likewise, in, in today's, you know, evolving landscape, technology, data play an important role. So we're going to touch upon some of those subjects. And the aim, of course, is to provide value to you because you're here dedicating time out of your busy schedules to come and listen to tonight's webinar. So um, that said, Rich, um, we can kick off with um, some of the first discussion points that we talked about. And I guess a good way to start is how do clubs, leagues, national teams, et cetera, how do they go about as the first step and identifying those potential brands or companies that could turn out to be the sponsors of that property. So um, perhaps we can kick it off there. Thanks very much, Diego, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I think the, the first thing to discuss is that every club, every league association, they approach the question uh, in, in many different ways. Um, but I think the most important thing to remember is that the main reason that clubs and leagues and associations look for potential sponsors is to raise their revenue. So to be frank, whilst there's lots of talk about making sure that the values fit, that the cultures fit, and these are all important aspects, the reality is the most important um, objective is a sponsor that will raise revenue, um, a sponsor that will pay money so that the club or the association has has the ability to buy better players or for a league to in order to invest in their marketing football as everyone knows on this call is a very competitive business it uh, it is as competitive off the pitch as it is on the pitch um and so if you imagine a football club it's not just about the men and women that play on the pitch and score the goals or, or etc it's also about the men and women that are working for the club, traveling around the world, trying to generate sponsorships and trying to raise the revenue for the club so that the manager 
can go out and buy better players. Ultimately, that's what it boils down to. Now, obviously, on the course, you'll learn about the in detail how each club um, goes about identifying different uh, sponsors. But I think a, a good way to look at this generally is many clubs in the top flight, and I'm talking about Manchester United and Liverpool FC and Manchester City and Arsenal, etc., they will look at identifying a category first. Now, what I mean by a category is, and it really depends on the club, but a category could, for example, be an airline such as Emirates or, or British Airways, etc. It could be um, in men's products like Gillette or razors or, or whatever it be. Um, because the fundamental point about sponsorship, the, the, the foundation that all sponsorships are built on is exclusivity. For example, you can see there uh, Saka wearing the Emirates um, on the front of Jersey. Now, Arsenal, in this example, will only have one airline partner, and that obviously is Emirates. And the most important aspect to that sponsorship is that Emirates is given the exclusivity around their category. And in this context, the category is airlines. Um, but but that can the category can depend on what the client or the sponsor wants. Um, but fundamentally, the most important thing is that each sponsor is given their own exclusivity within that category. So often a football club or a league or association will identify a category and then talk to as many companies within that category as possible. So I've never worked at Arsenal, but my assumption is that when Arsenal were looking for Emirates, they were also speaking to many other airlines at the same time. And there are many reasons for that, which we won't go into detail tonight. But but obviously, um, for any of those that are joining the course, these are the kind of topics that we discuss in detail, not just with myself, but for example, with Julie from Barcelona and from many other experts uh, from the industry. Um, Diego, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Rich. No, really interesting. And and by the way, Rich is um, is talking about our master's program, which kicks off in a couple of weeks, uh, where we you know go much deeper into a lot of these subjects with the experts from across um, you know numerous areas of the football industry. So uh, for those that want to know more, of course, you can get in touch with us afterwards. Um, right. So if we move on to um, our next question. You know, you, you touched upon this um, briefly in, in um, you know, in detail uh, and, and sorry, in, in, in general, just a moment ago. But how would a club go about building a sponsorship sales strategy? In other words, how do they manage this? Um, you know, looking at the short term, at the long term objectives. Um, I, I imagine, of course, that this is varying from club to club and from situation to situation. But what are some of the the, the takeaways that you can share with us? Thanks, Diego. Yeah, th this is actually uh, building a, an effective sponsorship strategy is very difficult, um, very, very difficult. So um, I think the first thing to, to remember is that it's a two way process. It's not just about which sponsors have money. It's much more in depth than that. Uh, the first step is to think about who are we as a football club or a league or an association? Um, where do we stand if we're talking about a particular football club? Where are we in the hierarchy of other football clubs? Um, one of the most effective strategies for building a sponsorship strategy is to think about the club not from a fan perspective, not to think about it from a historical perspective, but to think about it from a potential sponsor's perspective. So in that image there, you've got Pepsi, Santander, et cetera. Why should Pepsi sponsor this club? What is it about this club that attracts someone like Pepsi or Santander? And I find with some clubs or many clubs, there's often a disconnect between who they think they are and who sponsors think they are. So often football clubs will say, we have a hundred year history back in 1967. We won such and such a cup and we had this famous player in the 1950s. Well, that's great. Your fans love that. But the reality is 
Pepsi and Santander or whatever sponsored it is, they don't care. What they care about is, are you a good platform today for them to sell more products, for them to raise their brand awareness or in the likes of Pepsi, they don't need brand awareness, but for them in order to, you know, um, to, 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 to realize their marketing objectives. Are you as a football club a good platform for them? And I and I've whilst I've only worked at three football clubs, I've I've interacted with many, many football clubs over the years within the sponsorship area. And I find this is often a big problem that, that clubs don't admit. They only see it from their in their own perspective. Well, we, you know, we were champions many, many years ago, etc. The, 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 these brands don't care about your history as much as you do. What they care about is how can you help them sell more products? What is your global reach? And most importantly, and I'm sure everyone on this call fully understands this, what's your digital op uh, offers like? What are your digital platforms? What is your engagement with your fans? What demographic of your fan group can you help them reach that they can't already reach? So, for example, Pepsi is often about youth culture. It's often about young people and about trying to engage with the newest fads and the newest trends. How can your football club or association or league help them engage with the youngest members of the communities uh, around the world that they're trying to reach out to? Now, that's obviously just one example. But so the first thing about building a, a, a sponsorship strategy is to really think about who, who you are in terms of how a potential sponsor will view you not just how you and your fans view yourself. But the second part about building a sponsorship strategy is to think about, well, what kind of brands should we be reaching out to? Very often at football clubs, it seems to be, well, let's reach out to Pepsi or, or the biggest brands in the world, Coca-Cola. Um, but often this actually, from football clubs perspectives, is not the best strategy. Sometimes when you look at, the sponsors of football clubs in the market, it's often not the number one and the number two within the market share. It's the number four or the number five. It's the number four who wants to be number three or number two within their own category that looks to sponsor a top football club. So if we think about Manchester United, they had a they had they previously had a, an airline called Aeroflot um, as their sponsor for many years. And one of the drivers for Aeroflot was how can we, if we're number X airline in the world, how can we, how can we get better? How can we get more um, awareness within the audience? And a, and, a, and, a, and a top flight global football club like Manchester United or whoever it be, Arsenal, et cetera, they're a great platform for these businesses because they have such a global reach. Um, and so that's why it's important to identify. But of course, not every football club is Real Madrid or Barcelona or, or Manchester United or Liverpool, etc. There are clubs that do not have global audiences. So, you know, it's important to think about, well, what brands can our club work with in order to, 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 to what is it that we offer that, that is um, attractive to these potential sponsors? And that's often around demographics. Who are our fans? Uh, what age group are they? What is their spending capacity? Which part of the world are they from? Uh, these are all important aspects that when you have meetings with potential sponsors, these are the questions that they ask. Uh, rather than how many cups you've won and how many points you've got that season, they're not so interested in that. It's how, you know, which, who are your fans? And do, do the demographics meet our target demographics? And if so, there's potentially a good sponsorship there. I'll leave it there, Diego. Obviously, there's a lot more depth to that, but I appreciate there's some time constraints, so I'll leave it there for now. No, super interesting. Really, really insightful stuff. Um, because, in fact, you know, the next point that I, I wanted us to cover was, you know, you talked about at the outset that it's a very competitive landscape, both on the pitch, of course, and then off the pitch as well. So um, what are some ways that clubs can stand out in such a competitive marketplace i mean so that they can in, engage with brands and um, you know potentially differentiate themselves from from the rest are there any tactics or what's what's the best approach in that situation knowing that it's very competitive 
Yeah, well, it, it really depends on how much the uh, the chief executive and the club owners are willing to spend. Um, it's a very competitive market. When I started in sports sponsorship, uh, I used to travel quite extensively to Asia and it was either myself at Manchester United or or my peers at Barcelona who who were meeting with these people. Within three or four years, I'd go and meet a small company in a in a faraway country and they'd have already met three or four, five, six different clubs. So it's very competitive and, and lots of clubs are going out into the marketplace in countries all over the world because obviously football is a global sport. Um, but I would say that what we see today is most football clubs and leagues will use agencies. Now, there's many agencies that will provide this service. But what it means is, is that it, it takes the cost away from the football club because they engage an agency. The agency's job is to engage the prospective brands. And then if there's two or three within a certain category to them to introduce those brands to the football club directly. Um, but they'll negotiate the deal on behalf of the football club. And I know that's one of the questions coming up, so I won't go there yet. Um, but often clubs these days tend to use agencies. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, for example, I believe Barcelona and Manchester United, they continue not to use agencies. They like to um, continue to engage prospective brands in-house, i.e. by themselves. And often what they'll do is, is they'll have long lists. So I talked about categories before. They'll identify a category such as an airline uh, or, a, or a drink or, or a beer or something like that. And they will do some research and they will look at who are the top 10 or who are the top 20 brands within that category. They'll do some research on them. What's their revenue, et cetera, et cetera. And then they will um, uh, they'll try and engage that company. Now, that could be done in many different ways. It can be done by sending a letter. It can be done via a cold call, just calling them up. Um, but more often than not, football clubs don't tend to do cold calls anymore. What they will do is they'll send a little gift, a little um, sort of example of that football club, a little uh, a souvenir of the football club. It could be a jersey, it could be a football, something that, that represents the football club in their colours and their tradition and their history. And they'll reach out to the uh, to the potential sponsor and say, we would like you, we would like to invite you to be part of a process to become our next airline partner or whatever it will be. And then uh, the sales representative at the club will then try and arrange a meeting with them in order to show them a sales presentation, to tell them more about the sponsorship, more about the club and about the opportunities. Um, it's like in any sales process, it's always very difficult initially to engage the prospect, especially when they're in all part, different parts of the world. But once you have their interest, then you go and meet with them, then you can really try and start to move them along that process in order to become your sponsor. But there are many different ways that you can do it. Um, but as I just to summarize, more and more popular these days is to engage an agency to do it on your behalf. Excellent. Excellent. Really uh, insightful uh, information. Um, moving on, uh, Rich, I mean, here we have uh, the topic of customizing sponsorship packages. So, you know, how do how do clubs tailor those sponsorship um packages and customize them to the different brands that um, you know they're engaging with so anything that you can share with us on that particular point yeah obviously th this has developed a lot in the last few years um, the most obvious sponsorship packages are the front of shirt as you can see there at fly emirates or the insurance company aia or the tire company pirelli uh, uh, previously at inter milan um, but but it's become much more complex than that in recent years. So we can see the sleeve there, visit Rwanda or, or, or others. Um, and then there's also the around the pitch. You have what's called the digi boards. And then something that's been developed in recent years is regional sponsorship packages. So you have global sponsorship packages, which means that the sponsor 
can activate the rights in every country around the world. So Fly Emirates or AIA or Pirelli, because it's the front of Jersey, that's obviously a global sponsorship deal because it's seen all around the world. But some of the sponsorship packages will be regional. Um, for example, um, you know, you could have a tyre. So Pirelli there for Inter Milan, but maybe Arsenal will have a tyre company in the UK and Ireland. It'll have another tyre company for East Asia. It'll have another tyre company for Africa. Um, and that's something that means that you can dilute the exclusivity without compromising the exclusivity. So, for example, if you had a tyre company in Africa, you would give that tyre company the exclusivity to activate the rights, but only in the region of Africa. And the same for, say, Asia or East Asia or even by country. In theory, you could have 200 different sponsorships within the same category, although incredibly difficult, but it's something that you could do. Um, and then customizing the sponsorship packages, that really depends on what the prospect wants. If the company's main communication channels are through digital marketing, then obviously they're not so interested in non-digital rights and assets. So you can make sure that their package is predominantly about um, digital assets. Now that could be posts on the club's Instagram account, posts on the club's Facebook account. Um, but then there are other more traditional businesses that are less bothered or less interested in the digital rights. They just want the eyeballs. So what that means is they just want the digi boards. They want the front of shirt because they're not so interested in the detailed activation of the rights. They just want to raise their exposure. So they want lots of time on the digi boards around the pitch because that raises people's awareness of the brand. Other companies are a little bit different. They want to maybe do more um, CSR, corporate social responsibility. They, mish, they may wish to set up a soccer school in a different part of the world, be it Singapore, Southeast Asia, Africa, somewhere like that. Um, and then the club gives them the right to uh, use the intellectual property, such as the logo, in order to run soccer schools in those countries. And that's much more of a CSR, corporate social responsibility activity. I'll leave it there, Diego. Obviously, it's a lot more detailed than that. But um, again, this is something that we will focus on uh, in the program. No, this is great because we're touching upon a lot of uh, subjects. Um, and I think this is uh, really valuable for the audience. Now, um, the next point that um, you know we had here to cover is the role of data in sponsorship sales. Obviously, you've been around and in the industry for many years, Rich, and I'm sure you've seen the evolution of how things have have changed. So nowadays, uh, how do you find that data plays a role uh, when it comes to, you know, clubs or any type of property going out and, um, you know, looking for sponsors and likewise for the brands themselves uh, using this data, um, you know, on, on their side? Yeah, data is absolutely vital. Um, I'm sure many people on this call will be aware of the importance of big data um, it's absolutely vital. Uh, when I first started um, doing sponsorship sales meetings, it was more about the use of the IP, the use of the logo and the player images on the products. Um, a lot of the focus on the presentation was about the history of the club, the excitement, the amount of trophies the club had won, success, etc. That's much less the case now. The most successful clubs in sponsorship are the ones that whilst they include that because it's important they focus much more on very detailed data about the club and in reality data, the data about the club is about the fans because that's what the brands are interested in some of these football clubs have two three billion fans i mean i think manchester united was over a billion fans around the world fans or followers there is a difference um and of course, brands are interested in how can we connect with those people? You know, especially with modern technology, uh, there aren't one or two television channels anymore. People can look at uh, hundreds of different platforms. People are engaging with um, platforms that are outside your country be it via Facebook or Instagram, social media channels. No one really watches television anymore. Um, people will watch YouTube or equivalents 
around the world. So one of the biggest problems that brands have is how do we get the attention of, of our potential customers? How do we get attention of billions of people around the world that are looking at different things and have different interests? Um, and football clubs is a great way to do that because many of these big football clubs have you know over a billion followers and fans around the world, different countries, different cultures, different languages. Um, and so it's really important for the football club, the sponsorship team, to understand in great detail their fan base, where you know where 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 is the division of the fan base across the world? Is it predominantly in Europe? Is it predominantly in Asia? Within Asia, which countries is the club the strongest? What is the what is the average revenue income of some of these fans? Because you know if if you're a high premium brand. But the majority of the club's fan base are are of a lower economic scale. Well, then there's not a good fit there. So there's a lot of detail, and of course the detail is, well, they may be followers of your club, but how many games do they watch? How many how many average minutes do they watch of your games? Because there's a lot of followers around the world, but they may actually not watch your games live. So there's lots of data that these brands want, and the more data, the better. And so these football clubs, the the more successful football clubs off the pitch, um, they are able to 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 present them with with huge amounts of data. Um, and these this data is compiled by third parties. Um, it used to be companies like Kantar Sport, etc., um, but I believe they were acquired many years ago by a different company. But there are many companies that provide data in sport. And these are really valuable companies to to football clubs selling sponsorships because data points are so important to be effective in selling sponsorships today. Um, sorry, Diego, I see we have a question. I don't know if you from for in the chat group. Do you want to leave that to the end or? Uh, yeah, I see we have it there. Uh, as you wish, Rich, we can either do them at the end or if you think they're relevant now, we can tackle them uh, up to you. I'll just do this one if it's OK, because it's it's sort of relevant to what I was just discussing about demographics and. So for anyone that's listening to this and can't read the question, I'll just read it out on uh, on Nicola's behalf. It says, um, how much do clubs that lack a strong connection with local fans and fan culture target the youngest demographic as their primary audience and establish sponsorships aimed at that demographic? Well, that's a great question. Thank you. And to be frank, it's incredibly difficult. Um, many cultures around the world um, people tend to follow football clubs from a very young age or they follow a football club because of their parents or their family or their friends. Um, and so it's quite difficult to to build a new fan base. Now, in countries like China, for example, that's very different. Fans don't tend to follow the club. They tend to follow the players. So when Cristiano Ronaldo left Manchester United and moved on to Real Madrid, there was a big shift in the fan base in China who then went to, to become Real Madrid fans. When David Beckham played for LA Galaxy, the number one selling shirt in all of China was the LA Galaxy shirt because of David Beckham. So it's very, very hard for football clubs in order to build their fan base. Um, but I think one thing that you can do with local fans is to make the stadium a much more friendly atmosphere for young people and for families. That's something that when I worked at, at Inter Milan, the club worked very hard on achieving and I think was very successful in this regard. It's about providing areas that are family friendly. So you always want your ultras, you always want your diehard fans, but make sure they're in a specific area of the ground, uh, the stadium, and then maybe at the opposite end of the stadium or in another part of the stadium, you will have an area that's very friendly for families. And then the sponsors, they see, you know, that there's much, many, many more children going to the games. There's many more families going as a family. And then it becomes much more of a family orientated club. It takes a lot of time and a lot of hard work. It's not easy, but it can be you can shift the culture at the club that way. Um, and that's one way to do it is to start actually at the stadium, um, the, the home of the club. Um, but I'll leave it there because that's obviously quite a detailed question. But um, Diego, do you want to uh, we have another question, but let's crack on for now and then 
I'll, I'll return okay. to that next question. Perfect. Yeah, guys, we'll um, we'll leave the questions for a little bit later on, but feel free to you know either start start typing them now or or leave them for for the Q and A period. Um, moving on, Rich, and I, I'm sure a lot of the people listening tonight are wondering, well, how are these um, sponsorship agreements negotiated? So, can you talk us through about this process and as well as some of the challenges that clubs face when they're in this negotiation stage with the potential sponsors or the sponsors? Um, and what are the ways where, where value can be created for, you know, both the, the, the club and the brand? I think, uh, negotiating contracts is always difficult. Um, I think that the, the first most important thing is to make sure that the commercial negotiations have, have concluded and the, nego the commercial negotiations are the price of the sponsorship. The term, is it two, three, four, five years? And the rights. So, uh, Diego, you talked about sponsorship rights. If once your rights package is agreed, so all the commercial aspects, the rights package, the price and the term, once these are agreed, you can then move on to the legal contract. Now, the legal contract will often be prepared by lawyers. Um, those lawyers can either be within the club or there'll be often for smaller clubs, there'll be external lawyers that will write up the contract on your behalf. And then it's a period of negotiation between uh, the football club and the, the sponsor, uh, making sure that the contract is something that is um, agreeable to both parties. It's something that can take a long time. Um, and it's something that's often very challenging, but it's a very important part of the process uh, and it's important to get the contract right. One of the big, biggest difficulties of the contract is, of course, when you're dealing with sponsors from different parts of the world, um, because you have the issue of language, you have the issue of arbitration. If there is a disagreement with the contract, where is arbitration conducted? That's often a problem. Um, so, yes, there's many, many, many different um, issues. And then one of the biggest issues is making sure that the sponsor pays every year. Again, that's that's another issue as well. Um, but these are all part of the fun of, of working within the sponsorship department of a uh, of a football club. But without going to too much uh, detail in general, it's very difficult, but it's part of a process of negotiation. Um, and often you'll negotiate each different article of the contract. And it can take weeks, sometimes months. Interesting. Now, um, if we move on to the next topic, um, you know, there's the part of activating the partnership and delivering that value. So can you talk us through about the importance of a partnership being properly activated in order to drive value for the brand and gain that exposure that they're looking for? Yeah, so... Um, often, and, and when I um, worked at, at clubs such as Manchester United, etc., my only focus was on selling the sponsorships. There was a whole new department, a whole different department, whose job it was to help activate the rights and to make sure that value was being delivered. The reality is, is that um, for most clubs, the the responsibility of activating the partnership falls on the shoulders of the sponsor. Um, some clubs like Manchester United, Barcelona, Liverpool, etc., they will have partnership managers whose job it is to help the sponsor activate the rights. But the reality is, is that most clubs don't have the budget for, for such a department. And so it's the responsibility of the sponsor to activate those rights. Um, I think that often the, the sponsor relies on the club to help them activate um, and then can get a little bit unhappy if the rights aren't activated um but from my perspective really the responsibility should should mainly rest on the sponsors it's their job to activate their rights um i think the most important thing for them is to make sure that before they sign the sponsorship agreement that the sponsor knows it has enough budget in order to activate the rights um i i, I don't know from personal experience but i have heard of examples of some sponsors spending most of their budget on actually buying the sponsorship rights and then not having enough budget to actually activate them at the end. 
in that case, it's it's a failed sponsorship, uh, which is a shame um, because it doesn't benefit anyone or, or generate revenue for anyone. But I think the most important thing for a sponsor is to be clear on what you're trying to get out of the sponsorship. If it's about raising awareness of your brand, then make sure that you have a rights package that that delivers on that objective. It's if it's about delivering corporate social responsibility and sort of more local embedded sort of activations, then maybe something like soccer schools or, or running um, some promotions with legends, uh, some of the club legends, for, former players that are still very famous. At Inter Milan, we were really lucky to have Javier Zanetti as the vice president of the club. And he was amazing in traveling around the world on behalf of the club and working with the sponsors. And he's still uh, in many countries uh, as famous as, uh, as some of the top stars still playing today, um, a real gentleman and a real legend of the game. So um, some clubs can leverage off some of their former former players. Excellent, excellent. Um, right, so we're going to move on to the last few points and then we're going to open it up for your questions. Uh, but Rich, can you talk us through that renewal process? So we've talked about, you know, the, the stage where you go out, where you look for sponsors, where you negotiate, where you seal the deal, where you activate the partnership. But then comes the moment when, uh, you know, it's time for renewal. And of course, the main objective is to retain those sponsors and, and have them stay long term with the club or the property. So can you tell us a little bit about this process from whether it's your experience or just in general, how does this you know, process play out as far as renewing those partnerships and, and how to how to best approach this uh, this situation? Yeah, thanks, Diego. Um, it's it's difficult to get new sponsors, um, especially today. You know, it's a very saturated market. Lots of clubs across all different sports are are going around the world trying to find new sponsors. It's very difficult to find new sponsors. The best strategy is to renew the sponsors that you have. Um, but it's quite difficult to renew them, actually, because for many different reasons, maybe the sponsor wants to go in a new direction because in marketing, it's always important to be fresh and new. Maybe they feel that although the club has been a great partner, maybe they want something fresh. Maybe they want something new. Um, maybe that there is often a case where what the club promises and what the club is able to deliver, there's a big gap. And this is often a problem that football clubs face. So that that can cause an issue with renewal. Um, and often what can happen is um, because a business, a, a sponsor has experience now of dealing with the club and working within sponsorship, they then also negotiate a cheaper price or they negotiate very hard on what the price is because they know it's harder for the football club to go out and get a new sponsor than it is to renew the existing sponsor. So often the existing sponsor will negotiate uh, very hard in order to get a better deal on the renewal. So all in all, it's a very tricky process around the sponsorship renewal. The best strategy is to make sure for the commercial director to make sure that he or she knows when, the, when all of his or her sponsors are coming up for renewal and to make sure that, that the club goes out to market well in advance of that renewal date so that when it comes to renewal you have more leverage over the sponsor in terms of them not negotiating a really good deal because you simply have no one else so a uh, good organization is important in in that respect but in short it's it's difficult it's challenging right right um greg now um the next point that we have here is about roi and measuring the success of the sponsorship. So obviously you talked about data before and how much brands now look for that return on investment. So what are some KPIs that are looked at in the industry when it comes to sponsorship to try and determine, you know, whether or not the, the sponsorship has been successful? Yeah, not, not my area of expertise, I'm afraid. My job was always to, uh, to sell the sponsorships. However, um the measuring the return on investment is very very important for the sponsor 
Um, and often they will base that on, you know, as 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 the acronym shows, return on investment. If they've invested a million dollars in a sponsorship, how much has it has it made them in terms of revenue? Now, it's not as simple as that. If there's any stat uh, statisticians out there, it's very, very difficult to measure the ROI, the return on investment, very difficult to measure. And it really depends on the brand. What are their objectives? If their objectives is, if one of their main objectives is in order to raise revenue, then they will be able to see potentially a, a direct correlation between how much has their revenue increased over the time of the sponsorship. The reality is there's not a direct correlation between sponsoring a football club and your sales revenue. So you may look at other metrics in terms of brand awareness. You may look at very detailed metrics in terms of specific markets that you're trying to target. You may look at whether it's shifted the perception of your brand. If your brand is traditionally has a much older demographic, but you wish to make it younger, um, then, then you may look at the metrics on that. So it's a very complex uh, matrix of statistics that people will look at. Um, and it's very complicated how they measure these statistics. And I was never that good at mathematics. And so um, I'm afraid I'm not so sure how they measure it. Um, but I do know that it's not just a case of, well, have we sold more products? It's maybe it depends on the brand, depends what they're trying to achieve. But the return on investment the, the and measuring the return on investment is a very important step on the process. Excellent. And then we're off to our last point before our uh, participants can have an opportunity to ask their questions. But before that, of course, digital and social media in the past, you know, 15, 20 years have revolutionized the world, really. So in the industry of uh, football, and particularly sponsorships, it's been um, no different, I'm sure. So from your perspective, what has been the impact that digital and social have played on sponsorships, um, you know, in this day and age, given that everybody practically has a, you know, a, a, a smartphone in their pocket and, and a connectivity uh, anywhere they go, right? Yeah, uh, same as any industry, obviously, digitization has had a massive impact on football. Um, it's had a massive on, impact on how people consume sport. Um, and football clubs have had to adapt very, very quickly. Now, many, many clubs at all all levels of the game have adapted very well, actually. They all have um, social media channels. They have social media, a big social media team within the club or, they're, or they're, um, they'll, they'll outsource it. Um, and most of the clubs will have uh, digital platforms and social media platforms in many different languages not just English and Spanish or French, et cetera, but they'll also have it in Chinese, in Arabic, um, in, in Bahasa and, and many other languages around the world. So um, the the impacts of digital and social media on sponsorships, I don't think you can exaggerate it because it's been that important. And really over the last 10 years, more and more sponsors have been asking, we're, we're not interested in the traditional sponsorship package we want more posts on Facebook. We want more posts on Instagram. We want more posts on WeChat, et cetera. But this obviously presents a huge challenge for football clubs because fans don't want to engage with the club's social media channels and just be sold advertising to. They want to know about the players. They want to know about their private lives. They want to know about who's injured. They want to know some, some club history, some club facts. They don't look at the channels for advertisements. And so it's it's very difficult for the clubs to find that balance between not inundating the fans with too much advertising, um, but whilst keeping the content really fresh and, and true to the club. That's a real challenge. And I think that many clubs are still trying to grapple with how to deal with that. Excellent. No, really, really fantastic insights, Rich. Thanks for, for sharing them with us tonight. Uh, we do have quite a lot of questions from, from the participants in the chat. We will try to get to as many as we can. Um, of course, we're limited on time and uh, we'll try to get as, as much of your questions and comments in. So let's, let's uh, go to our 
participant questions, Rich, and I see that there's one from Bunmi. So Bunmi talks about the importance of the identity and culture of a club in attracting sponsors for a long time. So um, the question is, how important is the identity and culture of a club uh, in attracting sponsors for a long time? And, and then goes on to talk about UNICEF and FC Barcelona or Spotify and FC Barcelona. But it, it's an interesting point as, mm. as the balance no, between bringing in the revenue, but also maintaining that that uh, integrity, if you will, to, to your values or, or, or your identity. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Thanks, Bumi. It's um, identity and culture are absolutely crucial to a football club um, because whilst probably the most important aspect for a football club in terms of sponsorship is increasing revenue, at the same time, they need to make sure that it doesn't compromise their identity and culture as a football club. And I think you raise a great example in UNICEF and FC Barcelona because, as, as we're all aware, and, and Diego is now sitting probably 100 metres from, uh, from the stadium, um, <laughs> that, that Barcelona was really a champion in this respect because it had to take the considerations of its fan base on board. And the UNICEF, and I won't go into too much detail because this is a, on the programme and it's something that one of our speakers who used to work at FC Barcelona, talks about in great depth. So I don't want to steal his thunder, but um, the, the UNICEF it was a way to introduce sponsors to the, to the fan base. So UNICEF was seen as a stepping stone towards bigger, um, let's be frank, paying sponsors. Um, so if you like, it was a soft step so that the fans got used to having a logo on the front of shirt because the fans are quite happy. UNICEF, you know, it has a good brand. It helps people. It's part of the United Nations, et cetera, et cetera. And it got people, the fans of FC Barcelona comfortable with something on their shirt that it wasn't their colours. Um, and then that once the fans had kind of got used to it, then you saw FC Barcelona go for other sponsors like Qatar Airways um, Spotify that you mentioned there, and obviously they've had other sponsors during the years. So um, identity and culture are really important, but I think the Barcelona example is a good one because it shows that it's about finding a balance of being true to your identity and culture, but only to the extent that you can still raise your income by a few hundred million euros in this case. Yeah, no, good point. Good point. Thank you, Bumi. Um, there's another question from Carlos that comes up often, right? And it's the question about uh, how to sell sponsorship in the lower, you know, clubs, whether it's in uh, lower divisions or countries where there's not the top tier clubs. He talks about um, selling sponsorships for top tier European clubs being a piece of cake. I mean, I don't know about that. I think selling sponsorships is always a challenge, uh, but uh, but we take his point that yes, if you're selling for a big property, um, you know, you have more advantages than if you're selling sponsors in, um, you know, smaller clubs, whether it's in, in the lower division or in a country that doesn't have the massive exposure of, you know, the English clubs or the Spanish clubs, et cetera. So what's, um, you know, what's uh, your comment on that uh, particular point, uh, Rich? Yeah. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks for the question. Um, I always assumed it was easy to sell sponsorships until I started selling them myself. I think you're right. Uh, you're right that it is easy because you have brand awareness. Um, so, for example, when I worked for Manchester United, when you speak to people, they all want to meet with you because they all want to talk about Manchester United, even if they're not fans, they love football. So you're right that it's a piece of cake to get a meeting. It was a piece of cake to get a meeting. The, prob the difficulty comes in that the price was very expensive. So I always used to so sort of draw the analogy of a Ferrari. It's easy to get someone to want to drive a Ferrari. It's hard to find the people that can afford to buy a Ferrari. You know, let's face it, all of us would like a Ferrari if we could. The reality is not that many of us can afford it. So, and I think sponsorship of clubs like Real Madrid, Barcelona, and Manchester United is, is very much in the same category. It's easy to get people to talk to you. It's very hard to find the companies that will pay the money for uh, for you to sponsor them. 
However, it's a really important question that you raise. And just to, to, to anyone listening on this call or on the recording of this, in the program that we offer, we don't just focus on the big clubs because you're right. You know, selling the sponsorships and getting people attracted in selling a sponsorship for a top club, it is quite easy. It's hard to get them to pay the money, but it is easy to get them to attract it. One thing that we also focus on on the program is what about second tier, third tier, fourth tier football clubs? And in some of the um, assessments that we do and projects that we do, group projects as part of the course, we don't just ask you to put a, prepare a presentation on behalf of SE Barcelona. We don't. We'll give you some challenges. How would you sell Millwall FC? How would you sell Oxford United? Or in this context, how would you sell a small club from South America? And that's really to help you think about, well, what is it that we have? What assets does the club have? What is it, to Boomi's question, what is it the identity and the culture of the club that makes it stand out? So in, 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 in order to answer your question directly, I would say that as with any business, be it at the top or at the bottom, it's important to think about asking yourself the question, why would you sponsor this club from South America, for example? What is it about this club that attracts the sponsor? And I think for the smaller clubs, it's important to look at who are your fans. So, for example, you may, it depends on where you are, obviously, if you're in the capital city or in one of the big cities, you, you might find that some of your fans are wealthy individuals. They might own a business, for example. And so it's about you contacting them and saying, you're a fan of the club. Would you like to sponsor the club? And we can offer you some, some assets. And they could be bespoke assets. It could be an introduction to the players. It could be, it could be anything. But I think for the smaller clubs, it's important to think about who are the wealthy individuals that support your club because they're, they're less interested in the global fan base or the younger demographic. They're willing to pay money in order to get access to the club that they love. Um, and so that's sometimes a good strategy. And you see that in lots of smaller clubs, not only in England, but also in Spain and, uh, and Germany and Italy, for example. Great question and a very, very insightful answer, Rich. Thank you. Uh, I mean, we won't have time to go through all the questions, but we will uh, try and get to as many. So I see we have one here from Ghanem. Hi, Ghanem. Nice to have you in the webinar. So he talks about, do you have a predefined target of revenue prior to meeting the sponsors or the potential sponsors? And if yes, how do you define your target? Thanks very much, Ghanem, for the question. Um, it depends on the club. Uh, for example, I, I won't talk about who because it's it's um, it, it's sensitive or, or it's relevant to the internal club. But um, one of the clubs that I used to work at, uh, it didn't have a revenue target um, because uh, within sponsorships, ironically, many times the bigger the sponsorship. The uh, sometimes it was it was less hard than the smaller sponsorships. Um, so at many of the clubs that I worked at, you often spent more time on the smaller deals than you did on the bigger deals. It was quite strange. But I think if you if you think about a company, um, I won't talk about any specific companies, um, but if you think about a company, if their annual marketing budget is a billion US dollars, and you're asking for five million dollars in sponsorship revenue it's a very small part of their marketing budget so they're not going to think too much about it important five million is still important to them but it's not it's not a big big thing but if you're dealing with a company whose marketing budget is a million dollars and you're asking for eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars that's obviously 85 percent of their marketing budget so they're going to spend a lot of time making sure that this is the right deal for them, because if they get it wrong, that's 85 percent of their marketing budget gone. So often it actually isn't about the more money the sponsorship deal is, the harder it is. 
often it can be the smaller the deals are harder because the percentage of the revenue or this the percentage of the budget is much higher for that potential company so that's a real real challenge so in general you don't have a defined target for revenue for the sponsors but you're constantly pushed to close deals um so yeah Great. Now we had a couple of questions uh, from Gavin. So one of them was around uh, data and how do clubs and sponsors share share data. And then also, um, I see that he's got another question where he talks about do contracts have clauses regarding success or failure of the club uh, as far as performance is concerned for you know relegation if there's a reduction in payments, etc. So um, I guess we could tackle both of his questions, um, uh, Rich. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Gavin, for the questions. Um, for your first question, can football clubs and their sponsors share data on the customers? Um, no, is, is the simple answer. Obviously, it depends where the football club is. Um, but for anyone that's in Europe or familiar with Europe, you'll know that um, GDPR, which I can't remember what it stands for, but it is data protection, um, something data protection rights, I guess. So they offers consumers protection around their data that means that because of gdpr um, football clubs and sponsors cannot share data between themselves that's that's illegal so they won't do it however you can share you can show them in presentations macro data so you could say 50 percent of our fans are male 50 percent of our fans have jobs or whatever the data is um, but you can't say Mr. John Smith, age 41 from Exeter is, you know, obviously you can't share that level of data because that's against GDPR. Now, in other countries, they also have the equivalent of GDPR, but the I don't know enough about the legal systems to, to know to what extent they cover that. But a very quick answer to your question is, is no, it's against the law. Um, but in terms of your second question, um, in a, in a way, they do actually, because it depends on the football club. So, for example, a football club like Arsenal or Manchester City or Liverpool or Manchester United, they will not have a clause that talks about relegation because the club will say, we're not going to get relegated. It's as simple as that. So they won't have a clause about that. However, many of the clubs that are in sort of the middle of the table and below, they will have clauses. Yeah. So they'll say, for example, this is a three year deal. However, if the club gets relegated, then the cost of the sponsorship will decrease by 50 percent or 75 percent or 10 percent. Or that's part of the negotiation. Um, so, yes, uh, the contracts do often have clauses. Um, but as Carlos says very accurately, often it's 50 percent. And that is pretty much the boilerplate. Uh, but if you have a better salesperson or legal representative, they might be able to negotiate a deal that's, say, 20 percent, 25 percent. Or if the brand has a stronger legal team, then maybe they'll say we'll have a, what's called a get out clause. So if the club gets relegated, it cancels the deal. Great. Excellent questions. Thank you for that. Now, uh, David has a question and uh, he says in the context meaning the increasing pressures of the profit and sustainability rules what scope in terms of time frame of obtaining sponsorship is there for a club say if they surprisingly qualify for the champions league so to add a little bit of context he, he goes on to say for example clubs like newcastle united or aston villa or bologna or girona that um you know surprisingly will have qualified for for champions league um, you know, how do they capitalize on this status? Is there a realistic scope to take advantage of this situation? Uh, for example, for one year deals to cover the Champions League period. Um, so what's what's your take on that? Um, I, I'm going to divide that question in two because it's a very good question. But I think the Champions League is not a good example because um, obviously the Champions League has its own sponsors. So if you watch a Champions League game at Old Trafford or at the Bernabeu, et cetera, you'll notice that all of the brands, except for the front of shirt, all of the brands will be the Champions League 
sponsors, not the sponsors of the football club. So in a in a contract with a football club, it will say that you have the right to to show your brand at the stadium for our games. And then it will go into specific detail around in in an example of the Prem, English Premier League, English Premier League games, football association games and Carabao Cup games. And then it will say, however, Champions League games are excluded. And the reasons being that the Champions League has its own sponsors and it has its own exclusivity around that. However, it's a very good question because, um, for example, clubs that, uh, let's say, in the championship, uh, which is the, the second division of English football, if they get promoted, they have a very short period of time in which to find a new front of shirt sponsor. Because maybe in the championship, they get paid half a million pounds a, or dollars a year. Um, but if they go th up to the Premier League, they're going to look, for, obviously, to generate more revenue from that. And that's often where agencies step in. So agencies will be able to say, we have a brand, they're ready to go, they're going to pay two million, and we're ready to do it now. And that's where a good commercial director will have lots of relationships with different agencies so that if his or her club does get promoted, he can get on the phone and say, I need a, front, a new front of shirt sponsor straight away. Excellent. Some uh, really good questions. And uh, I, like I said, we're going to try to get to a couple more, uh, although in the interest of time, given that we've already covered an hour, we'll try to get to one or two more. But there's, there's some really good points. Um, you know, one of them is around the polarization. And Dennis Lav talks about, you know, how do you respond to companies that say that because of a sponsorship with Inter, they will lose AC Milan fans. Um, he talks about this in the Bulgarian market being a challenge uh, and one of the most common objections. So what's uh, what's your um, point of view on this particular subject of polarizing a particular fan base uh, in those big rivalries? Yeah, thanks, Dennis Lav. It's, it's a great question. And it's a question that comes up time and time again for people that are selling sponsorships at clubs. Um, when I worked at Manchester United, a big one was if if we sponsor Manchester United, does that mean that we that Liverpool fans will no longer buy our products? So it's a question that, that many clubs have to deal with. Um, and the reality is, I think it really depends on what market you're selling to. If, as you, you say there, you talk about Bulgarian football, and I think because I'm from England, I'll talk about the English example, I think if you're selling, if you're a sponsor and you're trying to sell more products in England or in the UK, then I think, yes, if you sponsor one club, um, a club such as Manchester United, for example, then potentially you are going to maybe lose customers that are diehard Liverpool fans. However, the reality is that many of La Liga, English Premier League, the Bundesliga, Serie A, etc. These are global football clubs. And the way that fans support their club in different parts of the world have a different relationship to, um, to the clubs that they support. So from my experience uh, of living in Asia for many years, if a brand sponsored Manchester United, for example, if you're a Liverpool fan, you may not necessarily actually be that bothered about it. Obviously, there are exceptions, but generally it wasn't a big turn off for for people in different parts of the world. Um, and ultimately, when you sponsor a club with a global fan base, you're actually it's not just about selling direct to the fans of that club. You're also trying to raise the profile of your business. And clubs like FC Barcelona, Real Madrid, Manchester United, Liverpool, etc. These are globally recognised brands. Um, so whether you whether you support the club, whether you even like football, actually doesn't matter so much because the logo of the club and the colours of the club and the players they're they're recognisable around the world, and that's what these brands are trying to key into. So. It is a question. It is an important issue. It's something that always gets asked, but it's actually not as um, it's not as direct as 
yeah, I'm a Liverpool fan, so I won't buy it. It depends on where you are. It depends on the degree of fanness of the fan as well. Right. Uh, well, we'll tackle one more question. I know there's some great, great comments and questions in the chat, but um, we have time for one more. And uh, it comes from Zail, Zailim. Uh, so Zailim says, how do brands choose which players to sponsor or which players to associate their image with? Um, so I guess we could tackle this in a couple of ways, no? Um, brands that sponsor athletes, but also, you know, we've all seen uh, the big sponsors that have an agreement with a club and they have, you know, four or five players that are usually the ones that are, you know, put out in front of the stadium or in some of their other activations. So, can you tell us how, how are these players chosen when it comes to um, the brands and the sponsors in those agreements? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so first of all, if if a brand sponsors a player, it, uh, it means that when they do brand activations or you see the images of the player, the player will not be wearing the colours of the football club because the sponsorship is with the player as an individual, as a private individual, not with him as a player of, let's say, FC Barcelona. So when Messi, for example, used to play for Barcelona, if a brand sponsored him, um, the image of him would not be wearing the Barcelona jersey. He might be wearing a T-shirt or he might just be wearing like a, 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 a Nike. Uh, is he Adidas or Nike? I've forgotten. He's Adidas, isn't he? Sorry, what was that, Rich? Was, was Messi Adidas or Nike? I forgot. Messi Adidas, yes. That's Adidas, right. yeah, thanks. I forgot. Um, so, for example, if you saw, if if a brand sponsored Messi, but outside of Barcelona Football Club, then he would just wear an Adidas plain jersey. Um, if a brand sponsors a club, then they will have th at least three players in all of their branding activations. And when we do the classes, you'll, we'll show you examples of this. But if you just go and Google now Messi and Pepsi, you will see that all of the Messi branding with Pepsi, that's for Messi as a private individual, he will not be wearing the Barcelona shirt. Um, however, as regards to your question, brands are often advised by marketing agencies about which players that they should be looking at. That not only depends on their profile, it not only depends on how successful they are on the pitch, it also really depends on how big is their social media following. For example, I think Cristiano Ronaldo has a billion Instagram followers. Someone could correct me, but I think it's, it's a lot anyway. So brands are more interested in, well, what's his or her reach? Again, what's the demographic? How engaged are the fans and followers on these social media platforms? But also it's important to think about the image. Is the player, does the player get drunk a lot? Um, uh, does the player, if he's male, does he womanize a lot? Is, is he in the press? Does he create a lot of bad negative image? And if he does, then, then it causes a, potentially a problem for the brand. So the brand may kind of leave it alone. They don't want the scandal. So if you look at Cristiano Ronaldo, you know, he's an amazing player on the pitch, but off the pitch, he has an incredibly clean image. And I know some people might say, yes, but, 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 okay, there's always stories. But the point is, is that he's been very successful off the pitch in making sure that he's kept, kept a very clean family image. He's an ultimate professional uh, and the same with Lionel Messi as well. The, these uh, these people are very well advised and they have very good, clean images. And um, with some exceptions, uh, they, they've been very, very successful for that reason. So the brands will also be advised um, by marketing companies about who is a who's a good person to sponsor. Um, if Jago, if we've got time for one last question, uh, Daniel asked a really good question about betting. Yes. Um, which is relevant not just in England, which is his example, but obviously in Spain and other countries as well. Indeed, yes, yes, please. Um, do you, would you mind reading out the question, or, or would you like sure. me to do? It? Let me. Yeah, I saw it before. Let me just go over. But um, yes, 
Sponsors of betting companies in England will not be able to continue until 2026 or thereabouts due to legal issues. Should sponsorship revenues for clubs decrease, given that such a uh, major player is withdrawing from the market? So very good. Good point. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, again, we'll, we'll go into a lot more detail about this topic um, during the, the Masters program. But I think for anyone that's not quite sure about this example, um, in countries like England and Spain, um, I believe in other parts of the world as well, Diego, right? In Italy, I think uh, maybe um, betting sponsorships have are going the same way as smoking sponsorships. So obviously smoking companies were banned from advertising in well, all sports, but in, in football. Um, and now we're seeing betting going the same way. And as Daniel uh, quite accurately talks about, um, a lot of revenue for football clubs, especially smaller football clubs, has come from betting. And so, so when uh, betting sponsorship is banned in England, or it has already been banned in Spain and in other countries around the world, it is going to have an impact on especially the smaller, the smaller football clubs. If you look at the top clubs, if we just talk about the English Premier League, um, the top six clubs do not have betting on their front of shirt. Many of the other clubs below the top six do. Um, and so it's going to really impact their revenue and it's going to cause them a few problems. Um, the, the, the issue is the same issue that many of the commercial directors have to face. They have to try and move on to a new category. They're going to have to try and move on and find where is the next big revenue driver going to come from? Is it crypto? Um, is it vaping? There, there'll be something else. Um, and of course, once betting's banned, then you may start to see a push for brands that are considered unhealthy, such as carbonated drinks, the Pepsis and the Coca-Colas of this world. Um, I can't remember when it was, but there's a famous example of Cristiano Ronaldo during a press conference taking the Coca-Cola, I believe, and moving it away from his table because he said it's unhealthy. So not just I'm not just picking on carbonated drinks. You also then have junk food like, um, you know, brands uh, such as fast food um, chains um, that are perceived to be unhealthy, such as McDonald's or Burger King, etc. So I don't personally, I don't think they'll ever be banned because they, they spend far too much money in sponsorship and they are far too important to the sports. Um, but I think that uh, betting companies um, have been perceived now to be not conducive to the sport. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And, and just to add that in Spain, uh, what the clubs now have is that they are banned from having the main sponsor, as Rich was saying, uh, as a betting partner. Uh, but if, if I'm not mistaken, they still have betting partners as part of the club, but they're in a category that is much less relevant than the front of shirt um, but, uh, but definitely the trend is, uh, what we're seeing you now that more and more they're being pushed out and potentially, um, you know, getting eliminated. Um, Diego, right, so can I just add one, add one point at the end, if that's okay, just of course. very quickly, one minute. So, um, in the chat box, we've got some great comments, some great questions, apologies, we can get to all to them. And I'm sure Diego is going to talk about that, but just to say, you know, there's some great responses to, to what Diego and I have discussed such as, you know, Carlos has come back and said betting sponsors are driving more people to stay in sports. Um, you know, it, it's crazy that betting is being banned in Europe, but in the US it's thriving. So just to give you an example of what a class would be like within uh, SBI, this is exactly the kind of thing that a class would be like. We'd be having a guest speaker talking like this, talking maybe for about 45 minutes, and then we'd have a Q&A session where everyone would be discussing these topics a lot of back and forth, a lot of people with their views. And it's a really great, um, this, this is why I wanted to highlight this now. Thanks, Carlos and Zaim and everyone and, and David that's that sort of responded to what we've discussed. You know, it, it, it's, a great, it's a great way to discuss these topics with people from all different parts of the world, from all different experiences. When you join the class, you're not just listening to someone like me. 
you're also engaging, you're also part of the process. Um, and very often when I do these classes with Diego and SBI, I learn a lot more from people like yourselves because you, you, you're all from different parts of the world with different experiences and different um, insights into the game that I could never understand just from living in my hometown. So thank you for sharing that. And hopefully that's given you a good example of, of what a class would be like at SBI. Diego, sorry, I just want to add that at the end. Oh, that's an excellent point. Thank you, Rich, uh, because it's true. I mean, and in fact, in the classes that we have for our master's program, there's a lot of interaction that is done with microphone. Obviously, here there's a lot of people tonight, uh, but there's also interaction where you have an opportunity to, you know, unmute yourselves, discuss, as Rich was saying. So tonight has been uh, that, an opportunity for you to learn from an expert like Rich that's been involved in the game for numerous years. Um, if you do want more information from uh, our side, let us know, get in touch with us uh, for our master's program. The intake in October, it's practically full. Uh, we may have one more spot uh, available, but that that's about it. Um, but we do have other programs throughout the year that we run. So get in touch with us if you want to learn more, if you want to, you know, upskill yourself on sponsorship or any other area of the business of football. We always uh, have uh, top professionals like we did tonight with Rich. Uh, and many others that take, that form part of the course and the different programs that we run at SBI so that you have an opportunity to gain, you know, insights from people that, um, that do this and that have done this for many years to learn firsthand from their experience and their, um, you know, insights uh, uh, of the game. So that said, uh, thanks uh, to everybody that participated tonight. Uh, we hope that you found value in tonight's session. Of course, thank you, Rich, for taking time out of your nightly schedule and come and share it with us here tonight and um, we look forward to seeing you in the master's program in the next few weeks and for those that want more information there's our website you can get in touch uh, from our website directly send us a contact form or send us an email uh, and we'll be very glad to hear from you and know more about your career aspirations and your career objectives and perhaps at sbi we may be able to take you to the next step so that said um, Thanks, everybody, for um, tonight, and we'll see you at the next webinar. All the best, everybody. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Diego. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye for now.